Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Rob Chapman. I'm the CEO of Founders Intelligence. Um, we're an entrepreneur-powered consultancy who help big companies to think about the future by looking at how entrepreneurs are trying to reinvent that future. And I am lucky enough to be talking to you about Gen Z and the Gen Z uh, panel we have, the amazing panel. And um, firstly, to define it, as Carolyn already has, by saying it's sort of 16 to 24, we're looking really at 9 to 24. And the best way of thinking about that group that uh, I've heard is people for whom 9-11 wasn't a coming-of-age event when you were too young. The event, the global event that defined this generation we're talking about was the recession. These are people who grew up and are influenced by the recession. And I think this panel, when I was invited on, has an incredible name. I don't know if it's up on the screen, no. A far-off world of which we know nothing. That is quite a bold statement for the television industry, so I really hope it's not true. And maybe just to test it quickly, uh, put your hands up if you have a child aged 9 to 24. Anyone in the room? OK, good. That's maybe even half of the room. OK, so hopefully you don't know nothing. Uh, and if you know someone aged 9 to 24, hand up. <laughs> OK, good. So what our panel is going to try and do is help you decipher those people. It's not parenting advice, I promise, but it is trying to understand what are the things that unite people of that age. You know, generational behavioral uh, science is not looking at kind of how do you define these, how do you differentiate them. We're looking at what unites a group of people of a certain age. And to sort of set the scene, uh, we have Love Island's Ian Sterling going to give us some of the facts and figures about, um, about that generation. If you think watching Love Island made you feel old, I'm about to blow your mind. Imagine a future where 10 million people attend a live concert without leaving their bedroom, where 12-year-olds are hosting house parties with best friends from around the globe, where Facebook is dead and TikTok is king. A time where teens don't even get a text because, hello, they don't text, stupid. But this is not the future. This is now, and they are Generation Z. These hyper-connected, super-opinionated 9 to 24-year-olds never knew a time where the internet didn't exist. They watch 68 videos a day and spend up to 10 hours consuming content on their phones. Appointment TV, that's so millennial. 70% of Gen Zers watch their favorite shows online on their schedule tab very much, preferring to binge a box set than wait around for tomorrow night. And if you want Gen Z to couple up with your content, first impressions count. They only have an eight second attention span. So with Gen Z now making up a third of the world's population, there has never been a more important time to turn their heads before they turn their back on TV for good. Great, so can I welcome the panel up onto stage? I... I can promise you it's going to be lively, because these guys have basically already done deals with each other in the green room. <laughs> um, so what we're going to discuss today is kind of four topics, really. What defines Gen Z? How do they consume content? How do you engage them as broadcasters? And then how do you make money from them? Where's the money in all this? Um, and I'm going to apologize, being at the Royal Television Society, we should be saying Gen Z, but I don't think anyone can bring themselves to do that, so uh, we will not use the Queen's received English today. Um, so let me introduce very quickly our panel. Um, so Amber Gill, as I'm sure everyone knows, captured the hearts of Gen Z over Love Island this year and was, of course, the winner. Um, the only show. Uh, or maybe not the only show, as Karen has told us, that people tune into in real time um, uh, of that generation. And you picked up three million followers in just eight weeks. Yeah. Then we have Casper Lee, who is genuinely YouTube royalty. Seven and a half million followers, been on it since 2011, one of the most uh, influential and creative people on it. Um, you know, recently uh, moving then beyond YouTube and both doing his own entrepreneurial activities, setting up a talent management agency, an influencer marketing platform. You've also been in uh, broadcast with Joe and Casper Hit the Road, which I'm sure a lot of people have seen, and also playing a seagull in SpongeBob SquarePants, which is uh, a big <laughs> accolade, and it sounds like Alan Carr was another seagull, so it is a pretty I do, cool I thing. do a good squawk. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why I got the role, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> You're going to go far. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Timo Amu, uh, so a serial entrepreneur, founded and sold his business, uh, first business at age 17. Uh, you're now uh, founder and CEO of Fanbytes, uh, which for those of you who haven't done deals of yet or don't know it, you really should. Um, so it's a new influencer marketing platform, really active on Insta, Snap, and TikTok. Um, so, you know, YouTube and Facebook, so last, last year. Um, over 2,800 campaigns done, including for BBC, NBC Universal, and the government trying to explain the minimum wage to people who don't understand it in that generation. So really important campaigns you're doing. I'm going to tell us a bit about how to get Generation Z to do all the work for you as a broadcaster. And finally, Paul Boryowski, another serial founder. Uh, so you're in your third company. Uh, the first was a uh, lo legal music streaming platform. He, I made sure I said legal, uh, that you founded <laughs> in uh, 1998, aged to 17 again. Um, and he's now the CEO of Scenic. Uh, which helps broadcasters, provides the tech for you guys to allow your viewers to simultaneously watch things together and comment on it and share it and have it as a social experience when you're not in the same place. So, you know, we've already been talking, Caroline's already said, I don't care what screen people watch it through. Paul is bringing the kind of game-like uh, social element that, that the next generation love and bringing it to traditional broadcast media. So, I'm delighted that you could all make it over the Cambridge, so thank you very much. So, let's start with... What defines and unites Gen Z? First question, eight second attention span. True? I hope not. Amber, no? <laughs> um, I don't think it's eight seconds. Maybe young, a bit younger than me, probably eight seconds. You've got to capture their atten attention very, very quickly. Um, otherwise, flick off some, on something else, different app, different video. Yeah. So I can, I can see how that's a thing. Maybe and, and, about 15 years old, though. Not, um, okay. I'm okay for that. And, and for you, what does uh, define Gen Z versus millennials? Is there a sort of set of attributes or morals or, or ways of behaving that you think are different? Um, I think that we're a bunch of very outspoken, opinionated. We really want to make a change, um, care about the environment and all that kind of thing, and looking at how we can do that. And I think that's what makes us a little bit different to millennials. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like the point about attention spans, that's something which we talk a lot about <laughs> at um, Fanbyte, and we've said like that is just completely, that's just completely wrong. So the idea that like attention spans have reduced doesn't make sense in a world where people sit down and give all their attention to a Love Island or like a Netflix show. Rather, we think that it's not attention spans that have reduced, but rather like interest spans have reduced. And so the onus on brands and broadcasters is not how do we like just get those five seconds. I saw on YouTube now, you can run like six second ads. So we've gone from a world where people are doing two minute ads to like 30 second ads to six second ads. Like what's next? Like two second ads. It's just like, hi, done, right? <laughs> um, so I think rather the, rather the onus is on like interest spans have reduced and the onus now is on how brands can tap into culture, how brands can really grab people's um, interest rather than the attention, because once you've got their interest, you can, you can continuously have their attention for like hours and hours and hours. And, and I'll give an eight second answer. Uh, <laughs> what defines Gen Z is they love to interact with each other. Was that eight seconds? That was, <laughs> that was <under. laughs> maybe left. Do you, do you want to pick up on gas? I think we also have the tools to see exactly what, uh, where we're losing the audience, so we can see mm. exactly what we're saying or what we're doing at the time the audience is, is leaving us. And we're now crafting our content around keeping an audience for as long as possible. So on YouTube, they have a system called Watch Time, where if your video gets 70% watch time, it gets recommended and it kind of snowballs into a viral video now. Because it's no longer just about clickbaiting people and getting them to watch your content, and then it gets loads of views. It's about are they consuming this? And they are. And you're seeing very high watch times on content that's made in that way. Um, it's interesting, I was talking about this earlier, where you have traditional broadcasters sometimes just putting up content on YouTube, and they're not thinking about things such as watch time, and they're wondering maybe why are my videos not doing as well? And then you see some of the broadcasters are, 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 are cur curating, creating content 
with the content that goes on TV, but they're creating it specifically for YouTube in the format that works there and makes people watch until the end, and those do seriously well. Yeah, and Timo, you're talking about um, uh, Washington Post and how they've embraced TikTok. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, so like we do a lot with like helping brands not only market to a young audience on TikTok, but also actually helping them like grow their own presences on platforms like TikTok and Snap, etc. And one of the most like interesting things was we started like doing some stuff with the Washington Post, and like they came and they were talking all about, we need to reach this audience, so, you know, here is, like, here are 50 videos of what we did on Facebook, just re-edit it and make it just, like, make sense for TikTok. And I remember one of ourselves, we was like, yeah, no, right? Uh, that's not gonna happen. And so what we've actually done is we've advised them with this idea of just getting people actually in the office to create, like, pranks and skits on, to their fellow employees. And just that has just skyrocketed their like, like TikTok growth. I think they're now on like quarter of a million or something like that. Like they are one of the most followed um, news organizations, even more than some of the like influencers there because they've taken this approach of we're not going to just go directly for the sale, we're not gonna make it about us per se, but rather we're going to get involved in like the pranks and the challenges and everything. So they've really obeyed the like rules of the platform. And I think like the other thing actually about this whole like Gen Z audience here is that like everybody, like everybody wants to basically have their own TV show. Right, and when you post something on Instagram or on Snapchat or on like TikTok or anything like that, fundamentally what you're posting out is what you'd post out if you had like a, like a film crew following you the whole time. So brands who think about like, how do we enable these people to create the best possible TV show, even to their own world of like 300 people, those are the brands who you've essentially built like an army of broadcasters because they broadcast themselves, but they also like broadcast you as well. And, and just that mindset shift is what Washpo have done like incredibly well and they're just gonna keep So growing. it's meeting Gen Z in where they are and doing the things they're doing rather than trying to force your own brand and own opinions on them. Um, Amber, can I pick up on, on the point you made about them being activist and uh, sort of caring deeply? You know, you immediately went, went to there. Tell me a bit more about that. Um, I just think they're very aware of uh, past mistakes. <laughs> and um, just, I think, you just, they just get fed, like, it's important to look after the world and look after each other and stuff like that. And yeah, it's that, I'm not really sure where that comes from, but I think probably it's gotta be looking at past and the consequences of what happens. I think we're very aware of the consequences of Yeah, I think that's right. I think I mean, we've seen, you know, the people talk about growing up in the recession and how that has changed their outlook where the generations before them have got it wrong and this generation I think really feels the need for themselves to actually be part of the solution so people are really acting differently and I think Casper some of your the stuff you talk about has a real sort of activist tone to it in that you are trying to I guess open up things that other people don't talk about like mental health like um, like all sorts of ways that you, you sort yeah. of impact the world. Yeah, I think for me it was never a strategy to go down that route. It's just when you when you kind of built up an audience and you have a voice, it, it, it's just if there's things that you feel passionately about, you're able to speak about that with your audience. Um, and yeah, I've been lucky enough to work with the Queen's Young Leaders and go and see the projects they've worked on. And I, may, I was able to make a video in South Africa with a guy called Leiso, who was a guy who watched my videos and he, uh, he was living with HIV. I just went there and made a video and it was just, it was the most interesting and like best time I ever had making a YouTube video and it was like, I gotta keep doing this kind of stuff. So yeah, no, it's, it's, just, it's just nice to be able to also make content around things that are, that are meaningful um, and not just do stuff that is just always brand funded or things yeah. like that. So, yeah. yeah, and it's the meaningful that really connects with people, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and Paul, you, you were talking about you know, how you, you understand Gen Z, you know, not being a Gen Z yourself, you've got interesting research techniques. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a millennial, and what I do too, I love observing human behavior. So, I'm mostly known for the 3 p.m. bus ride quote. 
Uh, what does that mean? Uh, I, I really like going on buses on the tube at 3 p.m., 3.30, because literally, um, you know, school kids are coming out, and I just like to see what they're doing. And mostly as just humans, how do, what, what, what makes them go to their friend, look at this, right? What is it? Um, how do they interact with each other? Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's where we, uh, at our company, Scenic, that's where we bring a lot of research. And that gives us ideas of technologies to build on, on how the next generations interact with content. So just to give you an example, yesterday at 3.30 on the district line in London, I saw one probably 14-year-old you know, looking at uh, stories, and then uh, he grabbed his three friends, and they all gathered around on the train, and for about 25 seconds, they watched the whole video, and were, and were laughing about it, commenting, um, and, and that's, that's the way we do research. We obviously look at hardcore data yeah. um, that come through all our technology systems, and we compare that, and, but to really notice the the next behavior and where we get ideas from is uh, that that's my research. And then what was that inspired by? I met once the head of, head of innovation at BMW um, at an event in Brazil. And, and I asked him, where are you staying? He says, I'm staying at a hostel. I said, but you are you're head of innovation for BMW in Germany. Why are you staying in a hostel? He says, well, I was staying in a hotel. So well, that's where I can really connect with the next generation of people who we're going to sell BMWs to. Yeah. And, and that's what inspired in our company to make that sh uh, change on, on how we do research um, and, and observe human behavior. Yeah. So, oh. let, let, let's move on to talk a bit about the content and really what makes great content for this generation, 24 to, or 9 to 24. Casper. You're the king of this. <laughs> what makes brilliant content for, for this generation? I think just n stuff that isn't too safe. I mean, the biggest YouTuber in the world is, quite con is a controversial guy called PewDiePie. Yeah. And, he, and I think he's proven that people are resonating more with people who are real and authentic, even if sometimes they fuck up. I don't know if I can say that. You can. It's fuck up, sorry. But it's, it's that authenticity that people want to see, and it's not, um, it's not about, as you saw in the earlier uh, video with Vic Star, it's about the fact that he can make a video, they said for 5,000 pounds instead of 50,000 pounds. I mean, he can make a video for five pounds and it could do better than, I think you asked me earlier which video did the best and it was just some video I made in my, in my house and I, yeah. it, it cost me nothing and it, it went on to, you know, do, but it was just authentic. Yeah. And when you start trying to add the glitz and the glamour into a platform that's not made for that. Obviously, there's a section of YouTube that is. You know, there's music videos, there's trailers. But what I'm talking about is like content creators on YouTube. Then uh, it's, it's, I think, authenticity. And I know that was thrown around a bit too much. It's kind of corny now. Uh, but yeah, just not trying too hard to say the right things the whole time. Yeah. And how about schedule TV? Uh, does Gen Z, do your generation uh, watch schedule TV? What was the last? Maybe it's Love Island, but. <laughs> Um, I think for my generation, Love Island's probably one of the last ones that you yeah. would watch at that time. And that's purely because of the social media conversation that's going on. You want to be a part of it. You want to know what the memes on Twitter mean. You want to know what's going on. And if you're not, then you're not up to date with what's happening. Yeah. Um, with everything else, like Netflix, you can watch it when, as and when you want. But I think with scheduled TV, there's got to be a social conversation for it to be watched at that specific time in the yeah. day. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I didn't, I didn't watch Love Island this year, but I knew exactly who you were, yeah. who you <laughs> dated, everything. Like, it's like Love Island was on our social feeds as yeah. well. Like, yeah, of course. With it. Of yeah. course. And, and almost like, you hear there, that's the reason to watch, not because it's the content you particularly want yourself, but because you have to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think, Timo, you are saying yeah. that you basically knew uh, that you, you missed Love Island episodes, but felt like you'd seen the whole thing as well. Yeah, so like, so um, two things, like, on the uh, first question you asked on this one. So on this one, yeah, like, I wasn't really, like, immersed in Love Island when it first started, and then I saw the tweets, and then I saw the memes, and I was like, everyone is talking about this, but I need to at least, like, get involved, right? Yeah. Um, and what happened was 
by the time I started watching it, I basically knew everything that had happened without so. watching a single episode, right? And I was actually um, saying to Amber before we came in, I was saying, well, I reckon you could actually create a TV show without creating the actual show. Like, I reckon <laughs> you could essentially distribute so much like meme-driven content, all that stuff, get people talking about it and not actually even have the show, yeah. right? Because I think what happens is like social media drives the narrative and then like people just form the narrative before actually even like seeing the show. Um, and actually, when I thought about that, I then texted someone back at Fanbytes. I said, we should create a TV show without actually creating the TV show. So we're going to do that. Um, <laughs> Business deals happen. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, and I think also just like the earlier point about like what is Hook and Gen Z, I think definitely this idea of like tapping into culture is one of the big things. Like this realization came, so we, in the past, we did this um, campaign for the government, right? And what's interesting is they came to us because they said they wanted to promote the new national minimum wage. And they realized that people, especially from like an ethnic background, had no clue. They were like constantly being ripped off, basically, about this. So what we did was we like found who are the key like influencers in these different, um, in, these, uh, in these communities, people on like Snap, TikTok, Instagram. And we basically got them to like tell people about it, right? Like, hey, the new minimum wage. But the thing that was really crucial about that was we used a bunch of memes as well in the content. And there's this really famous meme of basically like a cat stealing a dog's food and the dog like chasing it, right? And what's interesting is like people saw that, identified with that meme, and it was like, this is like my employer stealing from me. Right? <laughs> and so instantly that hooked people on. Like, like that ended up being just this like crazy successful campaign. But I think it's because it like tapped into the culture of what people were already aware about, the like yeah. meme driven content they were. And then that then drove them to think, oh, the government is kind of cool. I'm actually going to check this out, right? And if you can do that with like the government of all people, the government is right? Cool. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like if you can do that with them, then you know, it's plain sailing for pretty much everyone. <laughs> yeah, um, but before we come on to other platforms, I just want to hear from Paul, because I guess we were just talking about how almost the conversation is more important than the content, which maybe isn't the best audience to say that in front of when content has been king for so long, but you know, th th this sort of theme is coming out, and I guess your company is specifically trying to help broadcasters become part of that conversation and own that conversation. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how it works? Yeah, so um, basically, Seven years ago, I, the company used to work for big broadcaster, moved me out abroad, and I used to Skype with my dad whilst we both watched the, the same thing together. And that was seven years ago. Um, and I decided to leave, uh, leave my position at MTV and uh, set out on, on this co-viewing journey of watching together. Today, we're seeing, um, you can go on Twitter right now and type uh, FaceTime Love Island. And there's people saying things like Zoe saying, um, about to FaceTime my best friend Claire uh, for the Love Island finale whilst having a glass of uh, wine, right? Yeah. And they post this on Twitter, like screen grabs of them on FaceTime. So essentially what's happening is it's your content, but the, 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 the place of the content has not never been designed for the conversation to be there, right? You wouldn't think on Instagram the comments section will be like on another app. Yeah. The content is there, and the comments are right there. So why is it with video, TV, whatever you want to call it, um, the, the conversation it, it, you know, is not in the same place? And so we, we started working on, on Watch Together, and essentially that is your video chatting to your friends on exactly the same platform where you're watching. And BT Sport, um, who wanna, you know, they, they want to bring fans to the heart of sport you know, really engage them, yeah. um, uh, trialed our technology last year, and we smashed through every KPI, like retention, coming back, some people watching with their mates, um, mostly groups of two to three people. Uh, we're watching up to 103 minutes. Yeah. You know, I watched the Man United Barcelona game with my Man United fan, uh, friend, we just couldn't be together. Um, <laughs> so there were some funny, funny screen grabs from that. 
Uh, but that's that's exactly you know we want to we've seen this conversation is my bus story yeah. we've all done it uh, you know you probably have people g gathering around and watching videos and so that's that's exactly what we we work with uh, broadcasters yeah. media media companies OTT platforms to yeah. to implement this sort of video chat in their in their platform um, and yeah and and maybe could, could we just move on quickly to TikTok because we've mentioned it a few times you know. Actually, I was surprised even before that Casper uh, and Amber both saying actually it's it's not even my generation. It's, it's the next lot coming through. I, I'm yeah. technically gen a millennial like you. I'm 25, so oh, I'm getting okay, really sorry. Really I don't know spirit. what TikTok is. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Yeah. So, so it Timo, comes to me. sound to you, our, our sole <laughs> panelist who is a TikTok native. Yeah. So you know, I'm although you see the beard, I'm 23. So actually. I, I look like I have kids, but I don't. Um, and uh, and I think two companies. It's a bit like having kids, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. So I think, like, the thing that has really um, that has really enabled TikTok to take the market in in much faster than any social platform we've seen is actually because it speaks very much to the idea of what a Gen Z audience would like, right? So they have 60% of their audience, which is over a, like a billion people, right? 60% of their audience is between 16 to 24. And the fundamental reason why is because like platforms like TikTok enable everyone to essentially be an influencer, right? Like in a world where on platforms like even like YouTube and Instagram, where there's like a clear delineation between who is an influencer, i.e. the person with like, you know, 500,000 fans, etc., compared to like everyone else. The way content is surfaced on TikTok means like everybody with a bit of creativity and ideation, the person with 50 fans can actually have the same likelihood of going viral as a person with like 500,000 fans. Yeah. And to a 13-year-old to a 12-year-old sitting in his or her bedroom thinking, Jesus Christ, I have the same level of potential visibility as this like superstar here. That is a dream to them. And that's the reason why they really like gravitate towards that. And as like broadcasters and as brands, that is a massive opportunity because you can start thinking about almost like all the people on there is almost like your own mini TV broadcasters. If you can enable like everyone there to essentially be their own star of their own show, essentially be their own influencer, you suddenly get them creating some of the most mind-blowing content we've ever seen. Like, yeah. um, so I think that is the reason why like, TikTok increasingly is becoming relevant, not only to younger people, but also to like, brands as well, because they realize that everyone there is an influencer, and, and, and the variable to success is not follow account, but rather it's like creativity and ideation. And, and let's then talk about the future for broadcasters and how broadcasters can engage Gen Z. So maybe firstly, like, with the sort of cons media consumers hat on before we talk about you guys as creators, kind of what do you want to see from broadcasters? What, what can they do? Does ITV or Sky have a place to play in Insta, TikTok, YouTube, anywhere else? I mean, on YouTube specifically, I think a lot of them are doing a great job. I watch a lot of Good Morning Britain on, yeah. on YouTube. I think they've figured out a way to edit their videos and such that works for YouTube mm. and they've got good thumbnails and titles and these things are really important. Um, you know, I, I watch Sky News on YouTube for some reason. I just, even though I have a Sky, I just watch it on YouTube because yeah. I feel more comfortable watching things <laughs> on YouTube. So, and you also look, I think YouTube themselves and uh, other platforms are really obviously looking to work with uh, your BBCs, ITVs, because they still have that image of being kind of the Wild West and they want advertisers to be, feel safe. So when you look at the trending page on YouTube, most of it is traditional. It's mm. talk shows, it's trailers, it's music videos. So there's a massive opportunity still. Like, yeah. Even though these creators like Vicstar and uh, I mean, there's tons of them in the UK, even though they've done so well, I think you, know, you, you can do the same. I just think find people in your organization who know how to do that or hire them because you guys have amazing budgets and I'm looking for a job, so <laughs> that would be absolutely incredible. Yeah, and it's something we were discussing before about, you know, that you have to get that generation to make content that works for them, right? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, like, 
like when talking about say that government thing that we did like that that like meme was actually so we built this like network of these like teenagers who basically think about the content for brands and then we distribute it on social that meme idea came from a 14 year old kid yeah right like literally we came up with a brief etc and we were like yeah how do we get the word out to other like like you know 16 year olds or how do we get the word out to other gen zers oh well 14 year old kid came up with this idea of a meme great use that right do, do, do any of the broadcasters here employ any 14 year olds or <laughs> no 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 hands up <laughs> um, good but yeah like the content obviously has to come from the audience yeah. distributed by the audience yeah. um, seen from the audience and i personally th feel like you know when i was thinking about the audience here i was like you guys are so lucky because you just have an insane amount of content and an insane amount of good content that is just begging to be seen. It's just making sure that the delivery mechanism is done in a way which feels like natural to whatever platform you're using. And it's actually relatively easy. Just like spend a bit of time on the platform, you would get to understand all the um, various things. Like, I, you know, I go back to the Washington Post thing. I remember when it first started to work, I was like, you are a hundred year old organization, right? God bless you for quickly making that change because you understood that yeah. the platforms are different. Yeah. And, and I want to finish off by talking about money, right? Because it's all very well being on these platforms, but can uh, the organizations really make money from them? And I guess the first question actually to, to, to Amber of like, you know, you've just, you're currently, you know, the, one of the most recognized faces in the UK, especially by that generation. You know, you've just struck brand deals, I think. I don't know if they've been announced, but, you know, you, uh, you can, how would you want broadcasters to support you? You know, how could ITV help you to, to sort of capitalize on your, your fame? Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> how could they help me? Um, just putting on, you know, I think a big thing for my generation is the control in being interactive and everything like that. Mm. Um, the, uh, the kind of want to see behind the scenes what's happening after, what's happening behind closed doors. Um, if I don't post on Instagram for a couple of days, I get a million messages like, what are you doing, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so just kind of um, maybe like, like YouTube, showing what's going on behind the scenes, uh, what happens next alternate stories, like, because I get messages every day about me and a certain other islander, yeah. they wanted me to get together with him so badly. <laughs> but they're desperate to see that, I feel yeah. like they're desperate to see different variations of what happened. And um, an example of that is, I don't know if you've seen Black Mirror, Bandersnatch, yeah. that gave you options on storylines, which yeah. way you wanted it to go. And everybody was hooked on that. Even I was hooked on that. I couldn't leave my chair. I wanted to choose what was going on. And I feel like that's a massive thing that could be incorporated. Yeah, yeah. And so, so thinking about how broadcasters help bring yeah. you to prominence could actually help you to have lots of different formats yeah, for how you engage with your audience. And them as um, well. So we're going to have to go to our, to our people's panel in just one minute. I just want to quickly really put that question out yeah. to the others of, you know, actually, how do you really capture value from uh, from yeah, Gen Z. So, I mean, Vicstar, like I said again, I keep going back to that, but he was like, I don't get the opportunity that I want on, on traditional uh, TV or whatever. And he's also making so much money. I mean, the money that these people are making is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, so, if you can somehow collaborate with them where they feel like they have a part of the editorial, they have editorial control, and they, and they also, if this goes really well, which it probably will do, that they're gonna do really well, and they, ha they own part of the formats, and so on, and treat them like a production company. Um, I think there's, def they, they say they don't really wanna work with traditional that, that much, but there's still that prestige. Um, and I've seen it happen with Joe, Joe Sugg, my, my business partner, and a really good friend, and it's, it's just incredible, and there's still such a big power there, so yeah. they're open to it, just give them a good deal. <laughs> Super. So, <laughs> let's hear the response to that from the, the People's Panel. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Rob. I've got Amber. You're going to want to meet a couple of your Instagram followers are here. <laughs> I'm going to give them away. Uh, Josh and Maria. Uh, you follow Amber, don't you? And Love Island. I mean, you have quite different viewing habits, but uh, Love Island was the one thing that you, you and probably everybody that you know watches. Why did it tap in so well when people are saying, listen, 
you know, your generation don't really watch TV, but they do for Love Island. I think it's all about, like, relating to a character, the storyline, and the feeling that you're involved in it, you're part of it. Yeah, and getting to know them unfiltered. Yeah, getting to know what they're really like, seeing them unfiltered, and seeing just, like, how they live, really, in the villa, and how their relationships, like, progress. And so when people are a bit sniffy about it, or, you know, it's dumbing down, or whatever, people have a view of it, don't they? Actually, for you, it's actually informative it gives you it taps into your emotions yeah, it, does. yeah it, it makes you really see like how they live what they're like and what sort of like people they are yeah and you're a big gamer as well aren't you I mean, yeah. a lot of your personal time is taken up with yeah. video gaming can tv do anything to get you away from gaming or should gaming be part of tv in your view in the future i think uh, gaming could be part of tv and it could be interactive they can make like an interactive game i used to have this thing where you put something on and that makes it like interactive, so you're in the game, you can play the game and do all sorts of different things. And for you, Maria, what would you like to see more of? I mean, you know, they say that in your generation, I'm 42, so I feel like I'm sort of like an old lady, but you know, in your generation, TV is not the first thing you go to. Yeah, like, like imagine like a virtual reality headset, you know, that kind of thing, uh, where you can see like behind the scenes of the Love Island villa and like see what actually goes on and that kind of thing. That'd be really interesting to like see. Yeah, and do you think that actually watching TV together as a family, that's gone out the window now? Like that's never going to come back for you guys? Um, I wouldn't say never, but it's definitely like rare because um, normally you're just like on your phone or your iPad, that kind of thing. But there are the occasions where you do watch with your parents. Sometimes. Yeah, well, let's talk to a couple of parents, shall we? Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, we've got Phil uh, and Kerry here. You've got Gen Z kids. We have, yeah. Yours are 19 and 12, and you've got twins who are 15. Listen, you, what, are your, what are your concerns? You've got all the broadcasters' ears now. Uh, what is it that you want out of f the future of TV for your families? The word creativity has been mentioned quite a lot, but I, I'd like to hear the word positive influence and social conscience, because uh, I worry about what my child is watching and what influence that will have on So your 12-year-old watches a lot of YouTube? Absolutely, J purely YouTube. Purely YouTube. And yeah. is it, can you monitor it? Can you, do you feel like you know what they're watching? I can monitor to a, a degree, but I, I mean, he will show me what he's watching, which I just goes over my head. I can't understand what, what it is that he's interested in. Yeah, and Carrie, what about you? What, what are your twins up to? Um, my son also YouTube, but my, my daughter obsessed with Love Island this year. Last year, I wouldn't let her watch it. Um, I didn't think she was morally mature enough, whereas now she knows her own mind. Um, she has very high morals. She's far more interested in school than boys. So now I felt more <laughs> confident to let her watch. Yeah, and is there, is there programming that you would like to see more of? And, and again, the idea of togetherness, is that gone now? Or do you think there is something broadcasters can do? We saw Anton Deck earlier, they do it brilliantly. There, there are a few programs. I think the way that they're advertised could bring it back around to family viewing. Meaning? Um, where and when they advertise. If they advertised family-friendly programs on YouTube and during the adverts of Love Island, the children have been more keen to watch with their parents if that's the way it's promoted. Yeah, and Phil, I mean, do you, do you enjoy your TV viewing or are you more concerned about it for your kids? Is it still the most enjoyable thing in a way? I enjoy it myself. I think myself and my wife, uh, my eldest son enjoy it. Uh, he's more Netflix, um, but we will watch some things together. But I, I am very concerned with the way it seems to be moving. It seems to be more towards tablets, you know, for iPhones, things like that. Well, we're there, aren't we? We've got to embrace Absolutely. it. It was funny this morning as I left the house, my seven-year-old said to me, Mum, do you, would you prefer me to be more like morgues or jelly to <laughs> YouTubers? And I said, can't you just be a pharmacist like all good Indians? <laughs> <laughs> I really like to embrace it, but I'm resisting it slowly. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, back to you from me. Superb. Thank you very much. Amazing. So in our last couple of minutes, I'd love to sort of sum up and maybe respond to, to any of the points made there as well. Um, I mean, so far, it feels like a really actually optimistic panel from, from the sort of message for broadcasters is that the brands are still hugely relevant, the power is still there, that you all want to be working with, with the companies represented in this room. So maybe one piece of advice that you have to the, the people in this room in terms of how to engage with Gen Z, how to engage with you guys, and, and what they can do better. Who wants to kick off? Um, yeah, so I'm quick. Um, so there is this misnomer in the marketing world that uh, Gen Z young people hate brands and you know and all that stuff. That's just complete bullshit, right? Um, 
where I think we, at Fanbyte, we often talk about this idea of like advertainment, which is like the fusion of like advertising and entertainment coming together. And that's the way you really build these like emotional um, connections with people. One of the, my favorite ads was last year, it was by Nike, um, Nothing Beats a Londoner. How many people actually know that ad? Right, cool. Like, that was just an insane ad, and it didn't have any crazy like production value or like look so glossy, etc. But it tapped into the culture of the audience they were reaching into. It really honed on these principles of like advertisement. So, like, sure, you are advertising your stuff, but you're doing it in an entertaining way, which people would actually um, like to be a part of. And I think with like thinking about that at the forefront, not measuring campaigns by the number of impressions, but actually really having another metric there which talks about the emotional engagement with people I think just that it's like a really strong um, a really strong channel to go at, especially when we're reaching this younger audience and have you got one line each from the others one yeah, piece of sorry. one line of advice um, I think I think media broadcasters we're in a tech world um, you need to be 70% tech organizations um, you know to to compete in the world today so I would say Invest, uh, invest more in tech. Uh, Britbox is a great, great that is happening. Yeah. Um, finally, um, and yeah, so tech, invest more in tech. Super, Casper. Uh, help collaborate with, uh, help them create content and collaborate with them. Yeah. Um, social interaction and more control for yeah. viewers. Yeah, social first, content second. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, look, thank you very much for, for, for listening to us. So, I think the next session is entitled Running on Empty, uh, which I assume you all are now, which is why we have a coffee break. Uh, so thank you very much. Big round of applause for our panel. They've been wonderful. <laughs> <laughs>